Hey guys, my name is Ani Ramachandran and I'm an ultrasound fellow at the University of Cincinnati. This lecture will be talking about basic echo. Below are a list of indications for which you might do an echo in the emergency room. It is not meant to serve as a comprehensive list, but some objective findings which might make you reach for a probe would be tachycardia, shock, altered mental status or cardiac arrest, and some subjective findings would be chest pain, shortness of breath, or syncope. We will be looking at the five E's protocol. This is a protocol that was developed to help train and teach emergency medicine physicians on how to do focused cardiac ultrasound. The five E's stand for effusion, ejection fraction, ventricular equality, exit or aortic root diameter, and entrance, which is the IVC. The advanced lecture will cover valvular pathology and dysfunction, quantification of less ventricular ejection fraction, and as well as RV dysfunction. If you haven't had the time to take a look at this protocol, please look up the study for further information. When it comes to ultrasounding in the emergency room, patient positioning is key. Having the patient in left lateral decubitus position can significantly improve your image quality. This is extremely important when it comes to the emergency room as our time may be limited. It's important to do ultrasound in an efficient and effective manner whenever we can. Let's talk about our different images. We will start with the peristernal long axis view. Typically, the ultrasound probe will be placed within the fourth or the fifth intercostal space and the indicator will be towards the right shoulder. For the peristernal short axis view, we will also be in the fourth or the fifth intercostal space, but the indicator to the left shoulder. For your apical four chamber, you would be right over the patient's PMI or apical impulse with the indicator towards the left axilla slash shoulder. And for the subcostal view, we will be using our liver as a window with the indicator towards the left hip. Let's start with the peristernal long axis view. Once again, we have our graphic up here that shows us we're in the fourth or the fifth intercostal space with the indicator pointing towards the right shoulder. Let's do a quick view of our anatomy. Here we have our descending aorta. We have the left atrium, the mitral valve, the left ventricle, the aortic valve, the aortic outflow tract, and our right ventricular outflow tract. In regards to the five E's, in this view, we can look for effusion, ejection fraction, and exit. For example, the hyperechoic line that we see here is a pericardium. We can see a small pericardial effusion here. In addition, we can also see a small pericardial effusion over here. In this view, we do not see a pericardial effusion in this heart. And similarly here, we do not see pericardial effusion in this heart. In addition, let's talk about EF. When it, talk, when it comes to EF, we often look at the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve to see if it's hitting the septum or not. And in these images, we can't see the anterior leaflet does appear to be hitting the septum, indicating a relatively good EF. And we can talk about exit, which would be the aortic root diameter. Now, roughly, we always talk about the third 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 rule, which is essentially the left atrium, the aortic root diameter, and the right ventricular outflow tract should roughly be a third, a third, and a third. Sometimes when we see a large aortic root diameter, that can give us concern for an ascending aneurysm and or dissection. Now let's look at our parasternal short axis. Once again, the indicator is in the fourth or the fifth intercostal space pointing towards the left shoulder. We will start towards the base of the heart and work our way down towards the apical portion of the heart. We'll go ahead and review our anatomy. We have our left atrium, our right atrium, our tricuspid valve, our right ventricle. And you can actually see the pulmonic valve coming in and out of view here. As we work our way down towards the apex, you can see the mitral valve or a classic fish mouth view. As we go further down, we can see our papillary muscles. And once again, this is the left ventricle adjacent to the right ventricle. And as we come towards the apex, this is a view of the apex of the heart, where once again, we have our right ventricle and our left ventricle. In regards to the five E's, we can go ahead and look for effusion, 
out of all the views seen here, we can see a small pericardial effusion right around here. We can also assess EF or ejection fraction. Um, go ahead and take a look at the left ventricular wall and you can see how well with each ventricular systolic contraction, the blood is moving out of the heart. You can see how well the walls are coming together here. And lastly, we can also look for ventricular equality. So essentially the right side to the left side, the ratio should be 0.6 to one or less. You can go ahead and take a look at the shape of the right ventricle here, here, and here. And you can see that in regards to the size, it does look like it's 0.6 or less compared to the left ventricle, which does not indicate that the right side is enlarged. Next, we have our apical four chamber view. This is roughly done right around the patient's PMI with the indicator pointing towards the left shoulder or axilla. To review our anatomy, once again, we have the left side of the heart over here and the right side of the heart over here. So we have our left atrium, mitral valve, left ventricle, right atrium, tricuspid valve, right ventricle. Some of the ease that we can assess in this view is once again effusion. Effusion would be seen here surrounding the heart. We can also take a look at EF and see how well the left ventricle comes together during systole. We can also look at equality and see how big the right side is compared to the left side. Roughly, once again, you want a ratio of a 0.6 to 1 when it comes to right side to left side. We also have our subcostal view. So our, our subcostal view will be obtained by using the liver as a window. Our pro marker will be pointing towards the patient's left hip. This view is most effective to look for effusion. A large pericardial effusion or circumferential effusion can be seen in this view and it allows us to have a good window to also assess for tamponade to see if there's right ventricular diastolic collapse. And then we have our IVC view. So this will be the entrance, the last E of our five E's protocol. This view is useful to assess how well the venous return back to the heart is. As you can see, you can have, you see the IVC here draining into the right atrium. IVC here, as well as the IVC here draining into the right atrium, and once again, the IVC draining into the right atrium. This view is obtained in a similar location as our subcostal view, however, the probe marker will be pointing towards the patient's head. There are additional views possible. This will be covered more during our advanced lecture. However, I did want to provide some examples here. Right here, we have our apical two-chamber view. So this is the left atrium and the left ventricle. Here, we see our apical three-chamber view, which is our left atrium, our left ventricle, and our aortic outflow tract. And then this is our subcostal two-chamber view. It's essentially similar to the parasternal, Short view, however, obtained from a subcostal window. You can see our papillary muscles here, as well as our right ventricle. Some tips and tricks when doing bedside echo in the emergency room. Always start with the peristernal long axis view. This can be good to help orient you on the axis of the heart and allow you to obtain a baseline while obtaining the other images. If the patient has difficult peristernal windows, or has history of COPD with inflated lungs, you can reach towards a subcostal view first and see if you can obtain your images that way. Once again, patient positioning is key and having the patient left lateral decubitus can help with challenging apical views. And getting hands-on practice is always the most important thing to build comfort with echo in the emergency room. Now we will discuss some pathological echoes and go over some cases. This is an example of a large pericardial effusion leading to tamponade. So let's take a look. We have here a subcostal view. You can see we're using our liver as a window. As we can see, we see a large circumferential effusion around the heart within the subcostal view. We can also see we took a look at the IVC and it appears we have a pretty plethoric IVC with minimal or less than 50% collapse during respiration. And then here we have an apical four-chamber view, which is also showing 
signs of right ventricular diastolic collapse. So some of the signs of tamponade that we see in echo is once we can see right atrial collapse, and we can see that here when the valve is closed. We also see a plethoric IVC right here. We can also see right ventricular wall diastolic collapse whenever the valve is open, which is indicative of tamponade. And lastly, you can also do mitral inflow variations. Inflow variations greater than 25% can also indicate tamponade. It's important to note that all these findings are important to be taken within context of the patient's clinical condition. Most importantly, blood pressure, which will help guide your next steps. Now we can take a look at left ventricular dysfunction. On the left here, we have a normal heart. I want you to pay attention to the, the mitral valve, and I want you to pay attention to the walls of the left ventricle. In this image, you can see that it is coming together and squeezing well. Here's an example of a reduced ejection fraction. One of the things that stands out here is one, looking at the walls of the left ventricle, you can see this region does not appear to be coming together as well as this region. And lastly, this is a severely reduced ejection fraction. You can see there's really minimal movement of the left ventricle, indicating that the squeeze is not so good. Now let's take a look at LV dysfunction via the parasternal long axis. Here, we start off by taking a look at a normal heart. Here you can see the mitral valve getting extremely close or even hitting the septum. You can see the walls of the left ventricle coming together well with each systolic contraction, forcing blood out of the heart. Here you go ahead and see the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve trying to come close to the septum but not doing as well and the overall walls not squeezing as well with each ventricular contraction. And here is an example of a severely reduced ejection fraction. You can see how dilated the left ventricle is and how minimal excursion you see uh, the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve is doing and its distance from the septum. Another measurement that you could take with this view is your EPSS or end point septal separation. Essentially, you would go ahead and drop M mode right along the septum and the anterior leaflet of your mitral valve. We have an example here. Here, we go ahead and see the mitral valve opening and closing, and you would be measuring how close the septum right here is to your anterior leaflet to go ahead and get your measurement of your EPSS. Anything greater than seven millimeters would be considered abnormal. Now let's talk about right ventricular chamber size. This is the equality in one of the five E's. Let's start by looking at normal. Over here, you can see the right ventricle and the left ventricle. A normal ratio is about 0.6 to one, and you can see this heart seems to match that ratio. I also want to bring your attention to the lateral annulus of the tricuspid valve. This is a good area for you to look to judge right ventricular systolic function. What you want to see is vigorous movement of the right ventricular free wall moving back and forth, which indicates a normal function. Now we can go ahead and take a look at slightly more dilated, reduced function heart. You can see the right ventricular chamber size is almost closer to a one to one ratio. And the lateral annulus of the tricuspid valve seems to be moving slightly less vigorously as it is over here. And lastly, we have an example of a heart that is demonstrating McConnell sign. So McConnell sign um, is very specific whenever you have a massive or submassive pulmonary embolism, which is representative of obstructive shock on the right side of the heart. So let's take a look at this right ventricle, which is right here. One of the things that stand out immediately is the size, once again, is almost a one-to-one -one when it comes, when you're comparing to the left ventricle. You can also take a look at the right ventricular free wall. As you can see here, the right wall seems to be stunned and not moving as well. However, there is preserved right ventricular apex 
contractility, you can see it is moving vigorously here. However, the right free wall is not moving as vigorously. And once again, key into this area right here. And as you can see, it is not moving as vigorously back and forth as it is when compared to a normal heart. When we're also looking at this apical four view, one of the measurements you can take is your tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion. Essentially, you would drop your M mode right along the lateral annulus of the tricuspid valve, and you would measure from this trough right here to the peak, and anything above 17 would be considered as normal right ventricular systolic function. Lastly, we're going to take a look at the IVC. So an example on the left is an IVC with greater than 50% variation during respirations. You can see the walls of the IVC come together. An example, this is an example in IVC with minimal change with respiratory variation. As you can see, it, as we can see the respirations, the walls of the IVC do not appear to be coming together. You know, in summary, basic echo is extremely useful in the emergency room and patient care improves when the emergency medicine provider picks up the probe to scan a patient. Always remember that patient positioning is key and optimize yourself for success by having the patient lay in left lateral decubitus if, if possible. Remember your five E's, which is effusion, ejection fraction, quality, exit, and entrance. And at the end of the day, there's plenty of research out there that shows that we can do better and provide better patient care when we pick up the probe. So practice, practice, practice. Thank you for taking the time to listen, and I hope your comfort with basic echo has improved after watching this video.